What I want to do today is talk about a kind of a problem that is arising for modern utilities, which is how to plan the deployments of technologies in our distribution systems. And it's going to be a mix of a new way of looking at planning with data analytics as well. So typically, the way we have imagined the grid up to now um, is a top-down approach. So in a top-down approach, you, you think about the grid in, in three basic premises. First of all, loads are all taught in the aggregate at the level of cities or um, whole large neighborhoods. And mostly, these loads are going to be inflexible and very predictable. Second, you connect these loads to the generation resources by using long distance transmission lines. So that is the second big premise that we have. And typically, these generation resources are either fossil fueled or um, nowadays we can think about natural gas uh, as, well, as well, but it's a fossil fuel. Um, and the dispatch of this whole system is centralized. The planning for these systems has been taught taking these assumptions into account. Typically, you spend a lot of time predicting how much load you're going to have in the future. You take into account in a limited way the construction costs for your plans. And the flexibility of the demand very rarely factors into the future transmission planning. We have seen some studies now because of the large penetration of renewables where that's starting to be accounted for. But now if I decide to look into distribution systems and how they may look in 2050 looking forward, I'm going to have a distribution system that looks like this. Rather than a collection of homes, which I look into in the aggregate, I really have a distribution that is rich in resources. First of all, I have sensors that can measure individual homes. That allows me to look at individual behaviors and resources at a resolution that was not possible before. Second, I start to incorporate various forms of demand flexibility. I may have electric vehicles in my house. Maybe some part of my load is controllable in factories and so on. You already see that. At, even at the residential level, you're going to start to see more of that. Um, third, you're going to be able to incorporate technologies for generation in the distribution network. We saw just now um, we were discussing solar. We have seen EVs. The adoption has been slow, but there might be some places where the adoption is going to be high. And then um, another very promising technology is different ways of converting waste heat or even wastewater into power. So Stanford has various faculty investigating those and even with existing solutions being proposed. But this is very, very different than the world utilities have been used to. And when they start to plan, their future and plan what these resources and how they're going to impact the system, um, how to factor that is not very clear. One first piece to kind of understand this bigger picture is the very first bullet point I had before, which had to do with, with the demand flexibility. So in our future, and even presently, customers are starting to have way more demand flexibility. In there, I had photos of a Nest thermostat or uh, electric vehicle. We saw recently an announcement of storage for your home. And there is even behavior changes, such as uh, maybe working from home, which can impact how much electricity you're going to consume and where that electricity is going to be localized in time and space. Okay. Now, typically, utilities have looked into understanding your behavior by running programs which try to elicit different types of flexibility, such as demand response, or applying a time of use pricing, or giving you different rates and incentives. But they have had a very hard time understanding and being able to predict what is the impact of this on a customer by customer basis and profiling that. So the first thing we started to do to understand this new distribution system is build tools to help us understand the demand flexibility from a data standpoint. If I can record your smart meter data and weather data and so on, what can I do to understand and model a customer, whether he is in a plan, before a plan, or after a plan, and how to do that? So it's a very interesting and exciting problem. I'm just going to show you a little bit of this to motivate the planning method that we propose. 
So the type of data that we get is data like this, which we got from PG&E. So it's about half a million residential and business customers, two years of electricity consumption. We also can get data on zip code level temperatures and prices for the wholesale electricity market and do a lot of interesting things. But the question is, well, what do we do with the data? Traditionally, the way you learn customer behavior for power and electricity is very similar on how you would do it in a typical marketing campaign. I would send questionnaires to profile your home, or your family, or your small business, and I will include a small sample of these consumers into a plan, and then I will have a before and after. I will look at that difference and try to use these questionnaires to do a predictive model. Okay, and typically, you will do a lot of other analytics as well on top of that. What that has resulted in is that if you look at the performance of these methods in picking good customers that will provide you more flexibility or in the performance of the programs themselves, what we see, it's very poor. A measure of performance is yield, which is I have a certain target for my demand response system in terms of kilowatt hours in the peak hours for the summer what percentage of that I get. And PG&E actually officially calculated that finally for us. And they said, well, right now, it's between 15, and 20, 15 to 20%, depending on their um, zip code and operating region. So there's a very, very low yield. So it means they're not able to predict customers. So kind of an alternative philosophy is, in fact, I can record data from all my customers because if I have smart meters, that data, it's kind of revealing your behavior. S rather than giving you stated preferences, which I give through a questionnaire, I can show you revealed preferences through my meter data. From that, I can extract features, and I'll explain that in a second, and then I can use those to model my customer and predict their performance. And in fact, you can now also start to use the models that you have and use communications with the customer to kind of engage him in a learning loop. So right now, before coming here, I was just meeting with a company that is building this type of closed loop system with Stanford to understand how different types of behavioral interventions will affect demand response, for example. What are these features? These features are inspired in the same notion from machine learning and statistics. But instead of just being statistical quantities I extract from my time series, we really use engineering quantities that were used by analysts of buildings, facilities, and energy consumption, things like temperature sensitivity, or base load, or the peak to base ratio. Those are all features that we have seen in energy efficiency, demand response, building management. You can make a big list of them, and then extract it from the data, and use it for the data analytics. So what did we do with, with this idea? We got sponsored by the Tomcat Center, the Precourt Institute, and ARPAE, and we built a set of open source tools. We have first a set of libraries in R and Python that enables you to take the smart meter data and process it for millions of users. So right now, I think the last time we took a count was in February. We have more than 3 million meters analyzed. And you can extract features, target, do segmentation, build these response models, which are models that try to predict how much savings you will have for a specific user based on whether you were doing a randomized trial control or not. So we have an alternative method there based on using baselining and looking into forecasting and things like that. Together with this set of open source libraries, which uh, right now are used by a limited set of partners, but we are planning to open to the entire community around October. That's the end of our RPAE project. We also built a set of a website where you can visualize all your customers at the level of a state or a zip code and understand the dynamics of the different features, as well as understand how your programs are performing. So some of the methods we developed here have been incorporated into software used by OhmConnect, AutoGrid, and more recently, OPower. So they're using some of our tools for segmenting customers, as well as different partners are trying some of these ideas, such as State Grid, uh, PG&E, and Eon. 
So using this tool, you can get conclusions based purely on data, such as this one. What is our behavior? So load shape analysis for those who work in transmission is a very common task. We look at the transmission bus and we try to figure out what are the common load shapes that we have. That analysis has also been taken to a customer level for industrial and small business customers. For residential, what utilities always say is, well, all our customers are of that type. Every day, you're a dual peak, which is what we're going to assume. And well, looking at that, there's no point in engaging with you between 10 o'clock and 3 o'clock in the afternoon because you don't really consume much energy. So why should I worry about all the peak, peak hour management strategies for residential customers? This is the reality in pg and &E. When we actually ran our tools, we were able to extract load shapes for, for individual customer days. Out of 66 million load shapes, we found that about 200 explain all of our database, the whole database. And what these load shapes are, they look very diverse. You, know, you have more flat load shapes. You have single peak load shapes. You have people who are alert only at night. That's like uh, graduate students. You know, they're always doing stuff at night. You have guys who are only here on the morning. That's more like the faculty. They, are off campus most of the day. Um, then you have you know, traditional, regular families, um, and, and so on and so forth. So the first question we had, and this is how we got started with, with this whole project, was, OK, we did this analysis. And we said, OK, maybe 90% are like that, and all the others are just a small percentage. So this is what we found. 14% are these dual peak customers. And the immense majority of them are not even following that pattern, which you establish as your planning pattern for 100% of the population. So you can already see how if I took my, and then there is an interesting question, which is what happens when I average all of these residential customers together? I do see the dual peak. That starts to arise out of the average. But as we screen them individually, you don't get to see that. Another question we looked into has to do with forecasting. Um, here we were looking at operational forecasting. So these are predictions of 24 hours ahead or an hour ahead. And what does this, how does this forecasting behave? The first question I started with was, let's predict every individual customer, because forecasting is such an essential task, both in operations as well as when you start to think about program management. So, what we found is it's really hard to predict individual homes. Actually, papers in the literature are giving numbers around 50% um, forecast errors reported. I found a paper that was 20%, and then I read the paper very carefully. It was one home, which was the home of the person doing the forecasting himself. And if you look at the load shapes and all that, it seems he's most of the time on the campus. So that is an easy to predict home. But on average, when you look at larger sets, it's about 50%. And then if you look at system operators, they all tell you that the bus, I can predict 1% or better. Okay? And that, there's this big gap. We tried to improve it. We worked with some statisticians here at Stanford. We could improve it marginally. So then the question was, how does it scale? So we decided to do this scaling exercise where on this axis, we look at the group size. So we added a bunch of residential customers together to create an artificial group and predict them as a group. And then on this, I'm plotting the forecast error. So let's see what happens to the scaling. This is kind of the curve I get. And there is a nice statistical explanation. The rate at which you decrease there is 1 half. That is like averaging a bunch of random variables, Gaussian random variables together, if you like those sort of things. But at some point, your forecasting model, error bias takes over, and that improvement stops. So there is some amount of randomness in our behavior that gets averaged out when I aggregate customers to a certain extent. Beyond a certain point, it's not necessary anymore. So that was the first time something like this was reported. And this gave us a very valuable insight, which also informs our planning, which I'm going to talk about next. The first valuable insight is, if I'm going to manage a storage or a system at an individual customer level, is it any good if my forecast errors are 50%? Well, it's not. 
And the utilities will immediately say, well, forget all your dreams about distributed energy resources. Let's go all the way to this extreme, which is aggregate the whole thing. But what we've shown is maybe you just need to aggregate around 500, um, half a megawatt up to one megawatt, which is you know, about 100, 200 to 1,000 residential customers. And you get a very, very good forecast performance. So at that aggregation level, you can manage things as if they were a whole feeder. Okay, so that's what we call communities. So one fun thing we did was also, I just wanted to show it here. We took all forecasting papers. When we search for forecasting papers in electricity, you will find as many hits as like a search for in Google for, I don't know, buying something. So we found maybe something like 10,000 papers and we selected through the most cited ones. And I plotted some of them across our curve. Our curve was using a very simple forecasting mechanism. Anybody who studied forecasting must have seen an AR method, and you can do an adaptive AR. So with seasonality, that's, that blue curve is the forecaster that was generating that curve. And you can see all of these neural nets and many complicated methods, they're not doing that much better than our scaling. And in fact, many papers will refer to their adversaries saying, you know, 10 is better than 6 because I have a better neural net. But if you look, it's basically because 10 is predicting a feeder that has much higher power level. So you can take into account these metrics. And this is the type of insight wisdom enables you to very quickly discover. And we are hoping other people can add to it. It's, it's really open source. OK, so now to the. Uh, the, the next half of the talk, I just want to focus on this planning question. So we are all very aware about distributed energy infrastructure. I looked through the program. I know some, of, some folks talked about it here. And uh, more recently, uh, we had a postdoc who came from New York City. He helped write this plan uh, NYC document, which is planning all the infrastructure for New York City, from energy to transportation and so on. And it calls for a 10x increase in distributed energy infrastructure in New York City. So that is a very lofty goal. But here's the question. How do I plan for that increase? Where should I put it? Who should have it? How much I should have? And is it worth it? These are all natural questions. And if you're going to, what happened in New York, for example, is right now they're encouraging utilities to run this type of programs to achieve these goals. So it's not going to be independent power producers as they were imagining before. Um, so the question is, how are those utilities going to do it? Or even if I'm a campus like Stanford and I want to have distributed energy resources, what should I do? How, sh how much? Where should I put? So we need some type of planning tools. And these are the kind of core requirements we identified. So first requirement, we need to capture uncertainty. And there is kind of two types of uncertainties. In the operations, the day-to-day -day operations of these systems, there's kind of uncertainty due to weather and uh, loads and renewables and things like that. That's what I call short-term uncertainty. In the long term, there is uncertainty regarding costs. So for example, natural gas prices may be low today, may be high tomorrow. So we need to incorporate that in planning. Okay. The second thing we need to do is to capture some type of diversity in the load side. So again, that is not typically accounted. In traditional planning, this diversity is completely ignored. Uh, uncertainty is captured to an extent, but diversity is completely ignored. Loads are completely static. But you know, we have consumer behavior, energy efficiency, demand response, storage, electric vehicles, et cetera. The other thing that I felt is super important, and this is actually I learned from my postdoc, who, who is a civil engineer by training. He told me, look, Actually, you need to capture this deployment cost, but more carefully modeling the construction dynamics of these different systems. This is going to make a major difference. And in fact, he showed me some numbers. And one of the numbers that really was surprising was the balance of systems in solar, for example, is responsible to about 65% of the cost. But what is balance of system? I used to think, well, balance of system is that hardware that we put around the solar panel. No, it's actually the siting, the, permit, the permits that you need. There's a lot of steps. And those are very similar to all the things you need to do with construction. 
And the, the fourth one is network impacts. On purpose, I put it on black here because I'm not going to address that today. So when you're doing distribution, energy, the, the, the feeder planning, you cannot ignore losses. You cannot ignore voltage variations because those are very large compared to what you see in transmission. But we hadn't seen anything that had the three blue things, and we said, OK, maybe getting that to work is already a good first step. And in the, the next step, we will try to add these network impacts. The planning exercises today for feeders, they kind of mimic what you do for the transmission network. First, you look at the aggregate of all the loads in that feeder. So you basically take your city block and you average all these homes or add them all up together. And then you try to set on the other side different technologies with different costs. And then you try to do an optimization problem where you have some objective function like cost, emissions, et cetera. And you say minimize cost and match that to this static thing. You have a deterministic version of this, which is extremely popular, is the Homer tool from NREL. You have more probabilistic models very recently proposed, 2014. They try to capture some of the uncertainty with the solar and how that influences forecasting errors and so on. So if I have solar, maybe it will cost me more than I think because I have to have enough backup generation that can compensate the forecast errors and things like that. And then when I want to include energy efficiency or demand response, the only tool we found is this Durcam from LBNL, which again is a very limited way, just tells you, you know, take 10% of this and you say it's demand response, what is the result of the plan? So you run your optimization, it will tell you, well, you need this many solar panels or this much percentage of kilowatts of solar panels, this much percentage is storage, and that much percentage is CHP. That's your traditional planning. And the question is always, what's the infrastructure that kind of fits this aggregate system. But let's look at the reality. First of all, we made this assumption, and we already know from data that, that homes are diverse. We have different load shapes and so on. Second, all of these tools, no exceptions here, they assume these two scenarios are the same. So if I'm going to deploy solar panels in different sites, compared to a more central one side, I put multiple modules in the same site. Costs are the same, the time for construction is the same, and the uncertainty is the same. So that we know it's not true. So the question we had is, well, can we account for all that and how to do that? So we designed this method that we call rematch, which is more about representing this problem in the right way. The optimization itself is it's kind of an ongoing study of how to do the optimization, but um, we, it's, it's traditional optimization theory. But the representation is what I'm going to explain to you. And one of the things that we do in rematch is every consumer gets to be represented in the model. Okay? And they are going to be matched to the resources. So it's not just that resources match the aggregate consumers, is that collections of resources are matched to collections of consumers, and you kind of get this bipartite match. So it's something like a marriage type thing. You can think about it that way. Okay? And so just to show you kind of the basic uh, principle here, uh, in rematch, first thing we decided to do was we represent loads and generation as blocks. So at the very lowest level, these blocks are so many units of power consumed at certain times, and if we had a network at certain locations. And then I am going to have load blocks or demand blocks, and I'm going to have supply blocks, which are offered by the technology. And you may ask, why do we do this? Because if you start to consider consumers, now I have to ask myself, is it worth one watt of resolution, 100 watts, 500 watts, at what level do I want to do the planning? You know, so there are technologies that may affect things at below 100 watts. And if I decide my blocks are 200 watts, I'm not going to really consider those necessarily as important. And this is a very good way of capturing that. 
And the basic idea is we are going to set it up as a bipartite matching problem where all of these blocks are going to be on one side. All of those blocks for different technologies are going to be on the other. And you can imagine I have groups of blocks for customers for every hour of the day and for every scenario. So I'm going to set up scenarios as well for all of these matching. So for example, the way I set up scenarios is I can set up these blocks and assign probabilities for groups of blocks. And for example, for a customer, I can set up diversity of his load shapes. Maybe he consumes this 70% of the time, that 30% of the time. Okay? And I can have different customers. I can do more careful accounting of my construction cost because now everything is defined in terms of those blocks. It's very, very easy to do things like adding a module to an existing site is cheaper than adding a new site. Um, that becomes a very easy task. And for the uncertainty, what we do is we represent a scenario tree. And here the innovation is that we don't ask you to specify everything in a scenario. We ask you to specify what variables matter to you. So you may say, well, I'm worried about natural gas prices in the future, and these are the three or four scenarios I want to consider. I'm also worried that you know, in certain days it's going to be sunny, in other days it's going to be cloudy. You can see this is over years. This is inside a day. So in a typical matching, we only look at the average matching for a day. And as I add, our tool will go in and it generates a tree by assuming independence of these different scenarios. That's what we are doing right now to make it feasible for you to consider multiple dimensions that you want to have. Okay. So once I have these scenarios, I have a nice representation. The next question is how do I represent storage? Storage is very easy. In my matching, I typically only allow edges to go across the same hour. Storage allows me to match things across hours. So that is edges in my matching game. Second, I want to know how do I model demand side management. We are not going to give you a tool that does all the DR modeling for you. But once you know the effects of DR modeling, you're going to come up with typical what typically happens in a load shape. And you can include things like what uh, Southern California Edison asked us, which is only 30% of the time this actually happens. 70% of the time the customers actually deny my signal or my demand response signal or something like that. That's very easy because we have those scenarios and you can come up with, he's going to use, even under an EE upgrade, in a load shifting, he's going to use the solid line 70% of the time. 30% of the time, he's going to use the other line. We are forcing you to make some independent assumptions for those who like probability theory like I do. But this is much, much better than what's out there today. And kind of the tool itself, the way it's working right now in our lab, it integrates a bunch of different things. First, we have our module there that you specify the users that you want. And if you have the smart meter data, you process it through wisdom it immediately generates these profiles automatically. You don't have to do it by hand. And you can go into this tool rematch. Second, for the demand side modeling, that's where we don't really have a good way. What we are allowing you to do right now is either you can input how, what the response model is that you want to use for different policies and the costs, or you can use some suggested um, response models from Wisdom. In the future, maybe we'll add back this network we haven't done this yet. Okay. And now the question is, OK, we have all this fancy stuff. What's the point? So let's see the point here. Um, I want to do an exercise where first I will plan for six homes and see what happens. And then I'm going to plan for, I think, 10,000 or 12,000 homes, so a whole feeder. Okay. So first, for six homes, these are numbers that we took from Homer and different documents here, as you can see. Um, we are going to allow you to construct, to do a few things. You can add solar panels. You can add a natural gas generator. We are not considering storage. We are going to let you have a little bit of demand response, around 10% or de demand side management. And if you don't use any of these technologies, we are just going to assume for now the rate of electricity from the grid is 26 cents per kilowatt hour. Okay. So we did this exercise. We run this system through Homer. This is kind of what we found. 
We found a system that has a single natural gas generator. All the homes are equal. They are equally drawing from this natural gas generator and from the grid. That's our matching. If you do it for our tool, it's very interesting for these five homes. So I just took, in the previous one, I averaged the load shapes of the five homes. First of all, you start to build solar. Second, you can notice some homes are really getting a lot of their power is matching the profile of solar. So in some way, if I'm progressively deploying these technologies, I can say, well, this guy is really benefiting from that. So this was something Edison, for example, really liked because they can plan in their feeder when they add a technology which population is impacted and that has some marketing and wellness issues and all kinds of other side benefits, not just financial benefits. But in a more interesting economic sense, I can think of these matchings exactly like a market. And one of the things you're trying to do is you can actually potentially say, are these matching stable? And are they the economic way these agents would behave? And I think the answer seems to be yes. And you can see, for example, for this home is the one that's mostly getting it from the grid. Okay, So this is interesting, small matching exercise. We ran it. So let's do a more substantial one. And here is what we did. The line in the bottom here is, I think, 10 or 20 year operating cost, capital plus operating cost for the system. We ran the matching for our very large um, population. I think here it was something like, uh, I think it's 20,000 users. I'm sorry, I, I forgot here. Um, so 20,000 homes, and we said, tell me what would you plan? And here is the result. If you did Homer, it was banking it all on natural gas. And we are not even considering the diversity of natural gas costs and uncertainty in the future. If you now used our tool, first of all, it's significantly cheaper. Who can guess why is it significantly cheaper? This is kind of crazy. It cannot just be that I did a matching, right? Well, it's significantly cheaper because I included the construction dynamics. And it makes a big difference if I add more modules in the same site or if I construct a new site and things like that. So that is all included in our planning. And second, you can see that now we construct solar. That's another very interesting thing. You significantly reduce the amount of natural gas. And if you add demand response as an option, it further reduces cost by 8%. And after all this, you also know which customers matched with which technologies. Of course, electricity is going to flow through the network, and you, you can say that's not that important. But I think in a progressive deployment or even in a community planning setting, that is extremely valuable. Okay. So just to end here, I wanted to point out one another thing, and this is one of those things I learned about planning, which, which really bothers me and which I think we should change. Today, planning is done for all our systems based in a single opinion. If you look at transmission or distribution, there will be one favored consultant, you know, the guy who's your childhood friend. You know he's very good at you know, math tables. Maybe he should plan your system. The problem of the single opinion, if it's wrong, your plan fails. And I was thinking a lot about this. And one of the things I want to do in the future, maybe not, not now, now I want to finish this thing, but but in the near future is, is there a way to elicit plans from a much broader community? You know, we have Kaggle. So Kaggle is used to solve cancer detection from anonymous people submitting methods for the website. So can we do planning in that way? Because everybody has a computer. Many of these tools are open source. Some folks are really good at optimization. Other folks may be good in economics. So you could have a variety of plans and a diversity of opinions, and then make your decision. I think that will be very, very helpful, and it will avoid some of the existing pitfalls. For the future, right now, uh, we started engaging with Southern California Edison in their distributed energy resources planning exercise. They like this tool because it enables them to include their estimates and demand response and demand side management. We are starting to make rematch into an actual software tool. So right now, it's just an optimization algorithm, um, and then including network impacts. So thank you.
Yes. Yeah, so very fascinating analysis. So if I look at the last uh, chart that you showed and compare it to the previous talk about the LCOEs, does it imply that solar is much cheaper than natural gas because of the use case and the load curves, et cetera? And how would one take that into account? In yeah, so that's an excellent question. What this is saying is that if I cons consider your load shape diversity, I have enough customers that have consumption during the peak hours that nicely match up with solar. And then suddenly, I can start matching those. That's one piece. The second piece is the cost for solar. In this example, we allow the community solar site as well. So that was built. And I think that in significantly decreases the cost of deploying individual solar. And, but you can include, I want to point out the numbers and assumptions that are taken for this exercise can be changed. It's more about how do you organize the search for the solution. Okay. But I think it would be very helpful to extract a percentage or some factor that helps to lower the LCOE for, for PV or other renewables because this is a completely, uh, it's like, I think it's a fantastic way to look at uh, how a real life yeah, example so maybe, system Maybe works. we'll have to work with Stefan to figure out how one could use a tool like that. Um, one thing we are doing, though, is for Edison, we are in conversations to help them plan two or three complete feeders with their full data. So whether, if that pans out, at least for those three feeders, we can try many different ideas. But, but for me, the first thing that I really saw here was a way to incorporate all that diversity that is needed to be taken into account. Craig Lewis of the Clean Coalition. Um, fantastic work, Ram. These tools are so needed on the distribution grid. Um, the, my, my question is, you, you still have to design for kind of the, the corner case, right? That, that Saturday spring morning when, the, when, when everybody's off work and now you've got the, a lot of distributed solar cranking um, traveling up feeder, which the, most feeders have not been designed for. Um, so this gets to the integration costs of the renewables, and at the end of the day, you still have to do a power flow analysis. Yeah. So uh, does your tool, are you anticipating kind of yeah. you know, maturing this tool to be able to do that level of, of analysis? Yes, but one of the things I want to avoid is, so, so I'm, I, I love power flow, optimal power flow, and those equations, but one of the things I want to avoid is including them in their full gory detail in the planning because it makes it extremely hard to do exercises and what if cases, because you want to be able to run those very fast. So one of the things that we think is the next step for us is how do we approximate, for example, the backflow is not that difficult, but maybe the voltages, uh, we have some ideas and approximations that, that one of our postdocs has worked around and how to incorporate those in a clean way into this type of model. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks so, so I was happy. happy.